Okay, I'm going to get started just to introduce the event and a few housekeeping uh, sort of things, just running through what this run of show today will look like before we, we begin. So uh, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for spending a little bit of time in the eve of this uh, election uh, with us. Um, you are in a webinar entitled Musical Meditation on Women's Suffrage and the Fight for Intersectionality. I'm Emily Maestrellis. I am a senior program officer with the Global Health Justice and Governance Program at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Uh, I'm housed uh, and the program is housed within the Heilbrunn Department of Population and Family Health at the School of Public Health. And this event is part of a series uh, called Innovations for Advancing Women's Rights. Uh, we've had several events this fall and we'll continue into the spring and hope uh, that if you like today's event, you will join for future events. We will make sure to put in the chat some information for you all to check out other, other events in the series, watch recordings, etc. This event is being recorded and the, the recording will be available afterwards. All registrants will get an email with the recording. Um, so I'd like to thank our co-hosts before I move on. This is not just a, an effort of the Global Health Justice and Governance team. This is a collaboration, this event and the series between Global Health Justice and Governance, the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School and uh, the Feminist and Women's Movement Action Plan or FWMAP. Um, this has been a really fun partnership. And one of the things we're trying to do in this series is highlight the arts and how the arts can be an important and necessary tool for wellness and for activism, uh, which is why this event in particular on the eve of this election is so exciting to us. We will start the, the, the presentation or rather the event with a recording uh, that will go about 25 minutes. And then we will open up for our wonderful panelists to give some remarks talk a little bit about their work, and then we'll move into a Q&A to, to round out the webinar. So um, before we turn over to this video, I would just like to thank our panelists. Uh, so Sarah Overton from The Dream Unfinished, an activist orchestra that's based here in New York City, will uh, give us a little intro to the video we're about to see, um, and, and we'll continue on in the, the presentation uh, Q&A following the video. Uh, Jennifer Wilson is from the League of Women Voters in New York, and Amshala Jaram is from Demos. So we're hoping to have a really vibrant conversation after this video about the arts and activism, about voting rights, the history of the suffrage movement, um, the impressive and important contributions of people of color and the history of voting suppression nationally here in New York and what we need to do about it now. So we move into this next period and what is being referred to as the most important election of, of our lives. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce Sarah, who will then introduce us to our video that we're about to see. Sarah Overton is a cellist and an arts administrator living and working in Brooklyn, New York, formerly the program director for the Orlando-based nonprofit A Gift for Music. She led a, a team of 13 teaching artists to develop and provide engaging and tuition-free string music education programming to more than 350 students a year. In addition to um, her role currently at the Dream Unfinished, the activist orchestra I mentioned previously, Sarah is an REDC development fellow for the New York Foundation for the Arts. And as a performing artist, Sarah was the principal cellist for Classern Quartet, an award-winning string quartet specializing in the blend of pop and classical music. Um, both Sarah and Classern have been featured performers at uh, Walt Disney Resort in Orlando, uh, Universal Orlando Resort, rather. So Sarah, um, please uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today, for bringing this recording uh, to our attention. Um, I, I had, haven't wanted to spill the beans yet to, to talk about the recording in more detail, so I'm going to turn it over to you to, to let everyone here know what, what we're about to see and what a treat it is that this is available to us today. Yeah, thanks so much, Emily. Um, thank you for having me, and thank you for putting uh, you know this this whole institute together. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to be here. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the Dream Unfinished. 
Um, we got started about five years ago um, under our founder and executive director, An Lee, um, as a, kind of a response to what was happening with the Black Lives Matter movement at the time. And we saw that there was this gap uh, in the classical performing arts industry um, in terms of really promoting uh, composers of color and musicians of color uh, and, you know, kind of putting forward this artwork and this music. Um, there was a real absence there. So uh, you, see if, you see a need and fill a need. And that's kind of how the Dream Unfinished got started. So we were a collective of musicians and arts administrators, um, you know, starting to put this work together. So in 2016, we had our first season, which was the Sing Her Name season. So Sing Her Name was kind of an homage to Say Her Name, the hashtag Say Her Name that was going on at the time. And it featured music of composers of color like Florence Price and Margaret Bonds, um, and also included the premiere of a work by Ethel Smith, who was, uh, you know, the first openly lesbian composer of classical music. Um, so we, for the past few years, have been going on different themes. Um, you know, of activism. We are, are firm believers that um, activism and the arts go hand in hand. Uh, there's a way in which, um, you know, we describe ourselves somewhat like a car. Uh, you know, you have the hood ornament of the car and it's bright and shiny and, you know, you can put forward um, these thoughts and ideas. Uh, and then you have the engine of the car when you're actually utilizing music, you're utilizing the arts to get people active um, and uh, either register to vote like we did this year at our very first concert. Um, you know, we had folks come into our concert venue you uh, and be able to register to vote after the concert. Um, so there's a way in which we can blend all of these things together. And that's what we've been doing for the past few years. So this um, Fannie Lou Hamer's Sick and Tired event um, that we held on August 31st was kind of a unique combination of things. We were really responding, um, you know, to this virtual shift that everyone had to do. Uh, and we said, how can we get people active? How can we bring them together to, um, you know, hear something special and then inspire them to do something special as well? Um, so we decided on a community speech reading. We had done one on July 6th for Frederick Douglass's um, speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? And we gathered people from all over the country uh, to read different sections of the speech and have a discussion about Frederick Douglass and his life um, and Frederick Douglass as a violinist Frederick Douglass as a musician, as an activist, um, you know, as all of these things. And then uh, we said, well, uh, Women's Suffrage Month is coming up. How do we honor, um, you know, some of these really wonderful women, um, really wonderful activists and what they did. And uh, August 31st is actually the anniversary of some of the events that you'll hear going on in the speech. Um, so this community speech reading featured, um, you know, over 30 people from all over the country. We had folks tune in from Oregon and California, Texas, Georgia, Florida to come and read. Um, and we had folks uh, tune in from all over the country. And then it followed uh, up with a discussion from some really wonderful and thoughtful musical leaders. Uh, we had Danita Judge, who's the Associate Executive Director for the, Const uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, Dr. Ashley Jackson at Hunter College. Um, it was hosted by Jasmine Williams. Um, and then we had some folks just kind of come in and, and speak uh, on Fannie Lou Hamer's life and her legacy. So um, yeah, it's a really wonderful community reading and, and I'm so excited that we're showing it today. Thanks, Sarah. So just before we uh, kick off the recording, um, I want to remind anyone who's joined uh, more recently that the first 25 minutes or so of this uh, webinar will be uh, our, we're going to be able to view part of this community recording that Sarah just mentioned. There will be time for Q&A after that. Um, and please, if you do have questions and if they're coming into your mind as you're watching the recording, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, after the recording, we're going to hear just some reflections from our panelists and, and hear a little bit more about their work as it relates to women's suffrage, voter suppression, the arts and activism. Uh, and then we'll turn it in, over to this Q&A portion. Um, and so again, as Sarah mentioned, we're about to see a clip of the Dream Unfinished and Activist Orchestra's community reading of Fannie Lou Hamer's speech. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, which uh, is from 1964. So with that, we will begin the recording. My name is Fanny Lou Hamer, 
and I exist at 626 East Lafayette Street in Ruleville, Mississippi. The reason I say exist is because we're excluded from everything in Mississippi but the tombs and the graves. That's why it is called that instead of the land of the free and the home of the brave. It's called in Mississippi the land of the tree and the home of the grave. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola, Mississippi to try to register to become first class citizens. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that I was fired for trying to become a first class citizen. Community Reader, Sheree Oates. Community Reader, Sheree Oates. When we got to Indiana on the 31st of August in 1962, we were met there by the State Highway Patrol, the city police and anybody. As some of you know that have worked in Mississippi, any white man that is able to wear a khaki pair of pants without involving all of him and holding two guns can make a good law officer. So we was met by them there. Community Rita, Laura Kamsky. After taking this literacy test, some of you have seen it. We have 21 questions and some is not questions. It began with, write the date of this application. What is your full name? By whom are you employed? So we can be fired by the time we get back home. Are you a citizen of the United States and an inhabitant of Mississippi? Have you ever been convicted of any of the following crimes? When the people would be convicted of the following crimes, the registrar wouldn't be there. But after we go through this process of filling out this literacy form, we are asked to copy a section of the Constitution of Mississippi. And after we've copied this section of the Constitution of Mississippi, we are asked to give a reasonable interpretation to tell what it meant, what we just copied, that we've just seen for the first time. Violinist Kelly Hall Tompkins. After finishing this form, we started on this trip back to Ruleville, Mississippi. And we were stopped by the same policeman that I had seen in Indianola and a state highway patrolman. We was ordered to get off the bus. After we got off the bus, we was ordered to get back on the bus and told to go back to Indianola. We got back to Indianola, the bus driver was charged with driving a bus the wrong color. 
That's very true. The same bus that had been used year after year to haul people to the cotton fields to pick cotton and to chop cotton. But this day, for the first time that this bus had been used for voter registration, it had the wrong color. They first charged this man $100. And from $100, they cut it to down to 50. And from 50 to 30. And after they got down to $30, the 18 of us had enough among ourselves to pay his fine. Violinist Er Jean Kong. Then we continued this journey back to Ruleville. When we got to Ruleville, Reverend Jeff Sonny drove me out to this rural area where I had been existing for the past 18 years as a timekeeper and a sharecropper. I met there. I was met there by my daughter and my husband's cousin that told me this man was raising a lot of cane because I went to Indianola. My oldest girl said that she believed I would have to leave there. Then my husband came and during the time he was talking, this white man walked up and asked him, had I made it back? And he told him I had. And he said, well, did you hear what I said? My husband told him he did and I walked out. He said, Fannie Lou, he say, did Pap tell you what I said? And I told him he did. He said, I mean that. You will have to go down and withdraw or you will have to leave. I said, Mr. Marlowe, I said, I wasn't trying to register for you today. I was trying to register for myself. And this was it. I had to leave that same night. Host Jasmine Wilson. On the 10th of September in 1962, 16 bullets were fired into the home of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Tucker, where I'd been living after I was fired from this plantation. That same night, two girls were shot in Ruleville. They also shot in Mr. Joe McDonald's home that same night. And until this day, the place was swamped with FBI. Until this day, it's a very small town where everybody knows everybody. It hadn't been one arrest made. Composer Angelica Negro. That's why about four months ago when the FBI came to talk to me about my life being threatened, they wanted to know what I could tell them about it. I told them until they straightened out some of the things that we had done don't come asking me about the things that just happened. Do something about the problems that we've already had. And I made it plain. I said, if there is a God and a heaven, I said, if I was going to see you two up there, I would tell them to send me back to Mississippi because I know he wouldn't be just to let you up there. This probably don't sound too good to everybody, but if I can't tell the truth, just tell me to sit down, because I have to tell it like it is. Activist Amy Gottlieb. The third day of June, we went to a voter educational workshop and was returning back to Mississippi. We arrived in Winona, Mississippi between 10.30 and 11 o'clock on the 9th of June. Some of the people got off the bus to go in the restaurant and two of the people got off the bus to use the washroom. I was still on the Continental Trailways bus and looking through the window. I saw the people rush out of the restaurant and then the two people rush out had got off to use the washroom. One of the people that had got off to use the washroom got on the bus and I got off the bus. I went straight to Miss Anel Ponder. It was five of them had got off the bus, six in all, but one had got back on the bus, so that was five. I went to talk to Miss Ponder to ask of her what had happened. And she said it was state highway patrolmen and the city chief of police had tapped them all on the shoulder with billy clubs and ordered them out. And I said, well, this is Mississippi. Violinist Jennifer Coe. Violinist Jennifer Coe. I went back and got on the bus. When I looked back through the window, putting those people, I got off the bus, holding the eyes 
and she screamed. And her his car and said, you are under arrest. As he went to open the door, he opened the door and told me to get in. And as I started to get in, he kicked me and I was carried to the county jailhouse by this county deputy and a plainclothes man. They would call me all kinds of names. They would ask me questions. And when I would attempt to answer the questions, they would curse and tell me to hush. Community reader, Linda Everett. I was carried to the county jail. Whoa. And when I got inside of the jail, they had the other five already in the booking room. When I walked in the booking room, one of the city policemen just walked over, a very tall man, walked over and jumped on one of the young men's feet. James West from Itta Bitta, Mississippi. And they began to place us in cells. They left some of the people out of the cell and I was one of them that was placed next to the cell with Miss Uvesta Simpson from Itta Bitta. Naveen Siva Kumar. A couple of Saturdays ago, I went to a doctor in Washington, D.C., a specialist, and he said one of the arteries behind this left eye had a blood clot. After this happened in jail, we was in jail from Monday until Wednesday without seeing a doctor. They had our trial on Tuesday, and we was charged with disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. I was in jail when Medgar Evers was killed. Host Jasmine Wilson. What I'm trying to point out now is when you take a very close look at this American society, it's time to question these things. We have made an appeal for the President of the United States and the Attorney General to please protect us in Mississippi. And I can't understand how it's out of their power to protect people in Mississippi. They can't do that. But when a white man is killed in the Congo, they send people there. 
host Jasmine Wilson. And you can always hear this long sob story. You know, it takes time. For 300 years, we've given them time. And I've been tired so long. Now, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we want a change. We want a change in this society, in America, because you see, we can no longer ignore the facts and getting our children to sing, oh say can you see by the dawn's early light which so proudly we hailed. What do we have to hail here? The truth is the only thing gonna set us free. And you know this whole society is sick. And to prove just how sick it was when we was in Atlantic City channeling the, challenging the National Convention, when I was testifying before the Credentials Committee, I was cut off because they hate to see what they've been knowing all the time. And that's the truth. Arts Administrator Vanessa Rose. Yes, a lot of people will roll their eyes at me today, but I'm going to tell you just like it is. You see, it's time. You see, this is what got all this like this. There's so much hypocrisy in this society. And if we want America to be a free society, we have to stop telling lies. That's all. Because we're not free and you know we're not free. You're not free here in Harlem. I've gone to a lot of big cities and I've got my first city to go to where this man wasn't standing with his feet on this black man's neck. And it's time for you to wake up because you see, a lot of people say, oh, they is afraid of integration. But the white man is not afraid of integration, not with his kids. He's afraid of his wife's kids because he's got them all over the place because some of his kids just might be my second cousin. Host Jasmine Wilson. And the reason we're here today, we're asking for support if this Constitution is really going to be of any help in this American society. The fourth day of January is when we'll find out. This challenge that we're challenging the five representatives from Mississippi. Now, how can a man in Washington elected by the people when 95% of the people cannot vote in Mississippi. Just taking a chance on trying to register to vote, you can be fired. Not only fired, you can be killed. You know, it's true because you know what happened with Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney. And any person that's working down there to change the system can be counted just as another nigger. Community Reader, Gloria Lewis Vaughn. Community Reader, Gloria Lewis Vaughn. But some of the things I've got to say today may be a little sickening. People have said year after year, those people in Mississippi can't think. But after we would work 10 and 11 hours a day for three lousy dollars and couldn't sleep, we couldn't do anything else but think. And we've been thinking a long time. And we're tired of what's going on. And we want to see now what this here will turn out for the 4th of January. We want to see. Is democracy real? Activist did judge. We want to see this because the challenge is based upon the violation of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution, which hadn't done anything for us yet. And the U.S. courts tied it to Section 201 and 226. Those people were illegally elected, and they have been there. The man that I challenge, Jamie L. Witten, has been in Washington 13 years, and he is not representing the people of Mississippi because not only do they discriminate against the poor Negroes, 
They discriminated up until the 3rd of November against the poor whites, but they let them vote because they wanted their votes. But it will run until the 1st of July, and we need your support, morally, politically, and financially too. We need your help. Violist Ashley Gordon. People, you don't know in Harlem the power that you got. You just don't try to use it. People never would have thought the folks they said was just ignorant. Common people out of Mississippi that would have tried to challenge the representatives from Mississippi. But you see, the, the point is we have been dying in Mississippi year after year for nothing. And I don't know, I may be bumped off as soon as I go back to Mississippi. But what we should realize, people have been bumped off for nothing. Harvest and ecologist Ashley Jackson. It is my goal for the cause of giving those Negro children a decent education in the state of Mississippi and giving them something that they had never had then I know my life won't be in vain. Because not only do we need a change in the state of Mississippi, but we need a change here in Harlem. And it's time for every American citizen to wake up because now the whole world is looking at this American society. I remember during the time I was in West Africa, some of you may be here today because I don't know what it's all about, but I know I can tell you the truth too. It was a lot of people there that was called the PIAA. What are you doing over here? Who are you trying to please? Violinist Lady Jess. I said, all you criticize us when you're at home and you're worried to death when we try to find out about our own people. I said, if we have been treated as human beings in America, you wouldn't be trailing us now to find out what we is trying to do over here. But this is something we're going to have to learn to do and quit saying that we are free in America when I know we are not free. You are not free in Harlem. The people are not free in Chicago because I've been there too. They are not free in Philadelphia because I've been there too. And when you get it over with all the way around, some of the places in a Mississippi is a Mississippi in disguise. And we want a change. And we hope you support us in this challenge that will begin on the 4th of January. And give us what support that you can. Thank you. So I'm gonna invite our panelists to turn their video, their cameras back on as we move into this next portion of this event. And I'll just take a breath and a moment to reflect on what we just heard um, and saw. I think the, the combination of the voices and the, the music and also just physically being able to see 
everyone throughout this reading is really quite powerful. Um, so congratulations, Sarah, first of all, and, and to the Dream Unfinished for putting together such a powerful event, um, especially knowing that it kind of came out of challenges imposed by COVID in a way um, and rethinking your programming for this, this season. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm gonna introduce our panel and, and move into some reflections uh, from them and then the Q&A. And again, as a reminder, please feel free to, uh, to drop questions in the Q&A uh, that we will get to after this, this first round of reflections. For me, I think part of what I continue to think about is this, this tension in a way, this speech could have been written today. Um, it's certainly relevant today. Um, and there's that shock value too when you when you hear it and certain elements of, of these injustices that she's describing. Um, and, and I also think that's a danger, that shock value. And that we, we're shocked today constantly by the actions of our presidential administration. And so there's so many similarities, but I'm really thinking about kind of what that shock value is. Um, and I think it can be a, a way for us to distance ourselves from the problem sometimes, especially when we're thinking about a historical event uh, such as this. So, you know, things are different today, surely. That's just simply not true, really, at all. And, and we need to move forward into, into action. Uh, and so with that, um, I'm going to introduce Jennifer and Amshla, and then I'd love to hear from Sarah a little bit more about the recording and about, about your work, and then, and then reflections from the other panelists as well. Um, so first, um, I'm going to introduce... Amshala Jairam, who's the senior campaign strategist for Demos. Amshala came to Demos as a senior campaign strategist, bringing with her over a decade of experience in social justice and legislative advocacy. At Demos, Amshala now leads campaigns to strengthen our democracy through campaign finance reform, uh, expansion of voting rights, and also dismantling felony disenfranchisement laws that grew out of the Jim Crow era. The center of her work is upholding Demos's commitment to racial, social, and economic justice and ensuring that both the policies we fight for and the paths we take to get there honor those fundamental values. So thank you, Amshala, for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to introduce Jennifer Wilson, who is the Deputy Director of the League of Women Voters of New York State. Jennifer uh, serves as the in-house lobbyist and policy advisor to the League of Women Voters. Uh, before coming to the League, she worked as Deputy Regional Director for the Albany Office of Senator Charles Schumer. And uh, Jennifer has a Master's of Public Administration from the Rockefeller School of Public Affairs and Policy and has specialized in public management and policy analytics. So I think we have uh, three really incredible dynamic speakers to share reflections uh, and talk to us a little bit about about what this means today and about how art advocacy, um, you know, it's not just, it's a tool for healing, it's a tool for action, it's a tool for getting things done. Um, it, we have more power than we know and I think art can sometimes help us realize that. So without, without further ado, Sarah, I'd like to turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks Emily and, and um, thanks again for showing that uh, that video, that performance. I'm, I'm so glad that we got to share in that together. And I think, um, you know, what's really powerful that I, I hadn't mentioned earlier was Monica Ellis. Um, she is a bassoonist for the Imani Winds um, and her voice on her instrument just kind of throughout that. The bassoon, um, you know, is a cousin to the cello and, and uh, all of these things um, just kind of working together uh, to put forward the music of this. Um, you know, kind of a little known fact about Fannie Lou Hamer was that she herself was a singer. Uh, she published a few albums, one of which was Songs My Mother Taught Me. Um, and as they were on the bus uh, going to vote, knowing that, um, you know, they may not have their jobs when they come back, they may not have their homes when they come back, um, you know, from, from doing this uh, very basic human or very basic American right, um, you know, Fanny saw the disturbance within the folks that she took on the bus. And um, instead of giving a speech and going up to the front of the bus and giving a speech, she, she started singing. 
Um, and she started singing spirituals that were close to her. She started singing songs that her mother taught her um, and put something together so that everybody could sing with her. Um, so you heard a little bit of that in this performance as well. Monica had a couple of spirituals woven in there. I think Wade in the Water, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Um, you know, there were a few. Uh, and I think that in terms of just kind of art and activism, it always goes hand in hand. When you think about the 1963 March on Washington, um, and the music that was just kind of filtering through the air, people holding hands and singing. It has always been a unifier. Um, and what we're trying to do now, what TDU is, is really active in doing is making sure that we use music as, uh, as a catalyst for action. Um, so recently, our most recent season uh, was called the Red, White, and Blue season, right? And it's all centered on voting rights and um, you know everything that folks can be doing to get out the vote and encourage others to vote. Uh, and so we partnered with Democracy NYC um, and they had set up a table outside of a restaurant and uh, we put a violinist next to that table. And as a direct result of having music at that table, more people came by the table to see what was going on and more people registered to vote. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there are simple ways in which we can use music and, um, you know, use our talents as musicians, as artists, uh, to really spark people to think and reconsider um, and, and really get active. That's, uh, that's a great tip, I would say, for, for those uh, working in civic engagement and activism. Um, I think we could all learn from you and how to incorporate the arts better and, and work in this intersectional way. Uh, Jennifer, I'd love to turn it over to you now um, just to share your reflections on this recording and, and tell us a little bit more about you and your work. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I'm Jennifer Wilson. I'm with the uh, New York State League of Women Voters. And we do a lot of work on voter education and engagement in the government and political process, making sure that people know about their rights to vote and also about their rights to engage as a resident of New York City in our broader political uh, process. But what always is so striking to me about thinking about the civil rights movement and thinking about this emphasis on the South is that in New York state, we weren't that much better. In the Northeast, we weren't that much better than the South. And it wasn't until very, very recently that we updated our extremely antiquated voting laws. And even now we're seeing the result of waiting so long to update our laws mm -hmm. just this past week with early voting. This is only our second year with early voting and people were waiting six hours in line to vote early. So it was a long time coming here in New York state and even though we like to think of ourselves as this great progressive place, we really aren't where we should be as a great progressive state. So I always am so, it's just very frustrating for me to, to hear about, to hear these, these firsthand stories and to think about it in the scope of like that was happening there, but it was happening in other places too. And so it was, it was definitely very moving. So thank you so much for having me again. I'm excited to dig in a little bit more into kind of where we're at in New York State and kind of where we came from and even going further back into some of the, the suffrage issues that we have. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, I'm excited to, to dive into all of that as well. I'm so glad you're here today. Um, Amshala, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Emily. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, many thanks for inviting me to this amazing event. Um, I want to just start out by saying like how, uh, how meaningful and exciting it is to hear about the work that TDU is doing. Um, and I say that uh, in part because I think one of the things that we have finally kind of registered as an activist community and an advocacy community is that we have to learn how to engage with people um, in different ways and in deeper ways um, and in ways that really kind of like touch the heart as opposed to like, you know, spitting out a set of talking points. And it feels like, you know, that is exactly the kind of role that an organization like TDU can play. And like, how can we make that engagement not just something that happens, you know, 
once every two or four years during election season, but every day so that every one of us is really like personally invested um, in in our democracy and understands that it actually, it, you know, uh, this, this country belongs to us. It should belong to us, even though it doesn't quite function that way. Um, and just a, just a couple of thoughts. Um, I don't wanna echo too much of what uh, Jennifer just said, although um, I, I uh, totally agree with all of it. Um, you know, as you mentioned, when you read my bio, D Demos is very, um, intentionally committed to talking about issues of democracy in the context of racial and social justice. Um, and what I like to say is that like racial justice isn't isn't a lens, right? It's just, it's the whole game, right? Everything in this country is about racial and social control and certainly our democracy has been um, very much grounded in that context. Uh, and to that, I would also say that, you know, the reality is that voting in this country is a privilege. Um, it is impacted, access to the ballot is impacted by gender, by class, by race, by ableness, right, age, and that doesn't even touch on the actual impact of violence and intimidation at the polls, which we are seeing around the country. Um, and I think what's critical to understand is that all of these barriers, like uh, Jennifer was mentioning that we didn't have early voting in New York until two years ago, right? That's voter suppression, right? We don't call it that, but that's exactly what it is. And so while these like armed militia groups are threatening people going to the polls and it's kind of grabbing the headlines and it's the most alarming for, for all kinds of reasons, it absolutely is alarming having to wait five hours in the rain is just as harmful to our democracy and each is a kind of violence. Um, and sort of the one, you know, the way I think about it is that the one ultimately supports and enables the other. So I think really our challenge now is to address both the persistent problem of weak policy and the persistence, especially this year of outright violence. And we have to acknowledge that neither one is an accident. In this country, we invest in the things that we care about, right? Um, and for the power elite, democracy has not been a priority. And that is why you see the kinds of broken systems that we have in New York, that we have in Mississippi, that we have in New Mexico. Um, so, you know, one really kind of wanted to lift that up as well. Like never forget that every policy in this country is a choice and it's intentional and there are people behind it. Um, so the last couple points I just want to share is that, uh, you know, uh, in, when we think about intersectionality, right, like the what the pandemic has revealed is uh, just sort of how stark inequality is in this country. And then it's like, you know, multiplied it by a thousand. So we can no longer assume that people have even the basics that would allow them to cast a ballot. They may not have transportation. In fact, with the evictions crisis, they may not have a home, right? So like, not only can you not cast a ballot if you don't have a permanent residence, but the last thing that a family is gonna be able to deal with during, you know, when they are being kicked out onto the street is figuring out how to work vote and where to vote. Um, so I think, uh, you know, and, and the things that we're seeing in other places, like in the Southwest, for example, where a lot of Native Americans live on the reservation, you may not have internet. You may not have a traditional USPS mailing address, right? These are things that uh, I think people of at least some amount of privilege will take for granted. But if you are poor in this country, if you're a person of color in this country, you can't take anything for granted. And so I, you know, I really, I just, I love the, the theme and the title and the thinking in this panel because I absolutely believe that the only way we're actually going to like holistically address these things is to understand and acknowledge that it is holistic. People don't live in vacuums. And so policy can't be created in a vacuum. So anyway, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll close out. No, I think those are really important points. And I think about, you, know, you said policy is a choice. And I think a lot in public health, and as a researcher about how what we, we measure what we care about and we leave out what yep. we and what society does not care about and what is measured. I'm thinking about the census, for example, or a COVID response. That's about 
disenfranchisement, it's also about who's making the decisions about what counts and who's making the decisions about our societal values. And those two things should be related. It should be yeah. representative um, and it's not. Uh, so before we get into more about today, I would actually love to go back to Jennifer and just hear, especially given, you know, we have some important anniversaries this year. This isn't just a timely event for our election tomorrow, but this is the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, and it's the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And wonder, Jennifer, if you could say a little bit more. Uh, you alluded to some of that history. Um, I, I noticed last night I did a little research uh, on Fannie Lou Hamer and, and saw that she was a founding member of the National Women's Political Caucus. So um, I'd love to pull in some of that history to inform where we go next. Yeah, definitely. And certainly New York State was you know, again, I'm going to constantly harp on New York State because that's my specialty, but um, New York State definitely, I would say, is one of the, the best areas of the country, really soft suffrage in a big way, you know, out in Seneca Falls and out in Rochester, Susan B. Anthony, we have Carrie Chapman Cat and Elizabeth Cady Stan, but we also have a lot of Black suffragists that came from New York State, and Frederick Douglass is someone that I often think of and especially think of when we think about the really bad side of suffrage and the split between abolition and suffrage. And here in New York State, we saw that split in a big way. He worked really, really closely with some of the early suffragists, Susan B. Anthony, certainly, Carrie Chapman Cat, of course. And there came a point where they had to have a lot of really hard conversations and where Frederick Douglass really tried to make a point to point out that abolition and suffrage were going to have to divide at some point and that abolition was a lot more important at the time than suffrage. And at the Equal Rights Association meeting in 1869, he gave this incredible speech where he basically laid out everything that was at stake for Black Americans at that time, that they were being killed in the streets, their children weren't allowed to go to school, they were at risk every single minute of their lives, and then here were these often very well off, often had really, you know, good husbands who were treating them right, who are allowing them to go out and form women's committees for suffrage that weren't having any of these problems, weren't having any of these issues. But ultimately what happened was the women's rights movement split in two. So there was basically two factions, the National Suffrage Association and then the Women's Suffrage Association of, of America or something like that, very, very similar names, where one of these movements was, was very pro all women. They wanted you know, all women, regardless of the color of their skin, to have the right to vote. And then the other one was using Black Americans, Black American women, as a way to win over the South, to get members in the South to vote in favor of suffrage. And ultimately, the two factions met again, but there was this very long history between the two of putting down Black American women and using that as a way to win the right to vote for women. So there's this really dark history when it comes to suffrage that I feel like we have to talk about. We have to talk about it. We have to acknowledge it. And it didn't end after women won the right to vote in 19. It, 19, it still kind of continues today and it's really unfortunate. Um, and I have a great um, uh, PowerPoint that we often present where we talk about some of the incredible Black American women suffragists of the time and the incredible work that they did. So Journey Truth, Ida B. Wells, there's just so many that are totally neglected to be talked about today. I want to say a few more because I happen to have it open. Um, just to kind of give credit where credit is due because I feel like we do often forget about these women in history. Um, uh, Frances Harper, of course, she was an abolitionist. Uh, Ida B. Wells, I mentioned, she actually was a co-founder of the NAACP, which was formed as early as um, 1906, which is uh, incredible. Mary Church Terrell was another incredible civil rights and suffragist uh, and another co-founder of the National Association of Colored Women. So I, I just feel like there's so much out here that I could that I could talk about, but ultimately to bring it back together, you know, New York State, we we had the women won the right to vote in 1917 and then of course nationally in the 1919 but there's still a lot of issues today and there was a lot of people who didn't actually get the right to vote in 1919. Absolutely um, and I'd love to go back to Amshala actually to talk a little bit about voter suppression and and I love how you sort of you started to break it down a little bit for us and to different categories or different streams perhaps. And 
I think it's becoming something that more of us are aware of who are not necessarily faced directly with voter suppression in those kind of outright kind of violent um, systemic racist ways. But like you said, waiting in line or um, being removed from the from the voter rolls. Uh, I wrote postcards this year uh, to combat voter purges. And I think that's starting to become a more popular tactic. It's also starting to be something we understand a little bit more about. But if you could talk to us a little bit about what do we need to be aware of right now? And, and also, I'd love to hear from Jennifer and Angela, what, what should we be focusing on? What can we do um, to carry the, you know, the right momentum forward? Sure. Um, I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, you know, as I, as I said before, I think like the, the first step in terms of public education is to really understand and label things as what they are so that like um, if, you know, in Harris County, when they decided there was only going to be like one drop box voting voter, sorry, ballot drop box in the entire county, right, that's voter suppression. Um, if, uh, if you have to wait for four hours to cast your ballot, that's voter suppression, because there inevitably are going to be too many people who cannot do that. Um, and uh, one of the reasons and one of the, the issues that po has popped up in, in some of the states around the country that, that Demos works in is that, uh, so it can work two ways. Like for instance, in Florida, um, it's actually uh, um, help, it's been a sort of helpful, hopeful thing that counties can make their own decisions about like the number of ballot drop boxes they have, for instance, the number of, uh, in-person polling locations so that even though the state is, you know, is clearly sort of set against people uh, being able to cast their ballots, particularly black and brown people, there might be, you know, there are more progressive counties that are gonna try to do the right thing. Whereas in other states, like in New Mexico, it's sort of the opposite problem that um, there are counties that are, you know, kind of totally, um, I mean, this is a C3 event, so not to make it a partisan issue, but like there are counties where people, they don't want people to access the ballot. And so they're making it as difficult as possible. And in the absence of any statewide standards, you know, they can do whatever they want. Um, the other sort of thing that I think people are not often totally aware of is that the, uh, you know, sort of the folks that you're looking to for protection, right, the police, <laughs> or their sheriffs, right? Black and brown people are not gonna call the cops. Like if they see something is going down, they're not gonna call the cops. And sheriffs who often, um, you know, are, are actually not even technically law enforcement, they're politicians. And so uh, particularly in rural counties, um, in Louisiana, in New Mexico, in like all of these Southern states, the, their, that county is like their own fiefdom. So like, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a no man's land in terms of what, what is permissible. So like you can have a you know, caravan of, of uh, Trump supporters um, you know, circling a location and there's really nothing to be done at that moment. So I think you know, when I think about like what, what would be, uh, first of all, like what would we say to the legislature? Like what kinds of legislative solutions can we look to? Um, you know, I don't know, I, I, I certainly don't know the, the, um, all the answers, but I think it begins with, uh, number one, if there is violence, if there are threats, then the, it, it is incumbent on the state to act and to act early. I mean, we have known that seen this stuff bubbling up all over the country and governments really are not doing anything um, until, it is, until it is too late, right? Um, and uh, in terms of the infrastructure piece, uh, you know, there are variables you can control and variables you can't control. Infrastructure, you can control. Jennifer was mentioning um, New York State and in 2018, we had disastrous midterm elections, right? Like it was so bad that we, I think we made it onto the front page of the New York Times as like one of the worst states in the country, right? And that was, you know, that was part of what prompted action by the legislature. But again, like we could, we can see, and we are seeing the limitations um, 
of these reforms and and like thinking like oh this is a democratic state oh they have uh you know avr and same day registration we're all done we're not all done right because as long as you're not addressing all of the like 50 other things that people need to have in place because we don't it's not easy to vote then we're not there yet um so yeah so that's you know i think i think it would uh i think we need to have some real conversations about what what reform looks like what the asks are okay if you checked these boxes like what is left what do we still need to do and do we need to have a real conversation about how people actually live right and how like the inequality that exists in this country um, makes even the simplest thing uh actually very complicated for somebody without means So sorry, I don't know if um, you're still there, Emily. It looks like you're frozen. I think Emily's having a little um, technical difficulty, but Jennifer, if you want to jump in also on the on this question, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and I I think that's a, a fantastic summary. I, the only thing I would kind of add is that in New York State and certainly in many other states the counties and localities control the elections. And there's often a lot of room for interpretation of laws when it comes to counties. So the law might say one thing, but the, the actual level of government administering the election might do something totally different and be like, well, it's pretty much in line with the law. So the way we saw this with early voting is the law said one poll site per 50,000 registered voters and a maximum of up to seven mandated sites. But counties had the opportunity to appeal and say, well, I don't think I need as many as the law says. I'm going to ask the state board for an exemption because we don't have as many people interested in early voting. Or I'm going to do the bare minimum that's required and just do the seven, even though based on my number of enrollments, let's say in New York mm. City and Nassau and Suffolk County and Long Island, I should really be having like 30 plus poll sites. And another thing that we see or have seen a huge, huge barrier in New York State. And also, it really is the Northeast that seems to do the worst. Like Connecticut doesn't have early voting. New Jersey just passed their law for early voting. And we always think of like the Northeast, this great progressive place. But another barrier is registration. In New York State, the only way to register right now is through the DMV mm -hmm. with a DMV issued ID or license. If I'm living in a city, I probably don't ever need to interact with the DMV because I'm not going to drive. So that was a huge barrier we saw play out this year with COVID because of in-person registrations being so limited because we have such limited person-to-person -person interactions. And a lot of states, this is the case. Massachusetts, I believe their only way to register online is through the DMV. So if you are a Boston voter and you never had a license, you cannot register to vote online in Massachusetts. That's something that our legislature did address in 2019, but the law to register online doesn't take effect until 2021. And our automatic voter registration law doesn't take effect until 2023. So again, it's something that it should have happened 10 plus years ago. Texas has had early voting for 30 years. There's absolutely no reason that we are just getting these reforms in New York State. Thank you. So sorry about that minor technical issue. Seems to be cleared up now. Um, Sarah, I really wanted to turn it back to you, um, not only to weigh in um, and comment on the remarks that Amshala and Jennifer just gave, but also to talk to us a little bit more about TDU's process. Because again, I think as both of these other panelists have brought up, that engagement with the arts um, is such a powerful tool and we need to do more of it. And I'd love to hear more about um, engagement, intersectionality of TDU's focus um, and democracy building and how TDU can is engaged in that space and what you would recommend to other activists for engaging more in that way. Yeah, I, um, I, I've just been so enjoying listening to Amshala and Jennifer, um, you know, really, really go in depth on these things, um, because this is something that when we think about, um, especially what Amshala was saying in the way that people live, 
um, you know, art is the way that people express themselves uh, throughout their lives and the way that people tell their stories. Um, so what TDU is so adamant about doing when we select composers of color, we select, um, you know, it sorts all sorts of marginalized musicians, marginalized composers, and we think about these music selections and the things that we're putting forward is we think about their stories, um, you know, and we think about how to best tell their stories so that others can relate relate to them, especially in this in this idea of how do we carry this with us every day. Um, we want to make something impactful so that you remember, uh, you know, that people were suppressed, that people have been marginalized, that, um, you know, they've kind of had to come up through the cracks, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, in order to get a spotlight on the stage. And I think a lot about, uh, you know, Margaret Bonds. Margaret Bonds is somebody that, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ashley Jackson discussed at the end of this um, Fannie Lou Hamer presentation. And Margaret Bonds was a 19th century composer, uh, Black composer and musician. And what she did was host other Black composers and musicians at her home. Uh, and she promoted them. She promoted their work. She uh, helped bring them up through the education system. She helped, um, you know, just kind of develop and cultivate uh, the work of these composers. And when you hear about and think about all of the obstacles and barriers to just making music, to just getting a classical music education, um, you know, to just having an instrument, all of these things that she had to go through and that she had to help other people navigate, uh, that sort of thing sticks with you. And then you start to wonder, well, why is that? What are the systems and structures in place, uh, you know, that are uh, oppressing and suppressing this music and these people and their expression? And so, um, you know, TDU in our process is really just trying to shine light on those systems. Like in 2017, we had our, Raise, our uh, Raise Your Hand series, and that drew attention to the school to prison pipeline. Um, so it featured music from community uh, arts education programs like Win Music Project, the Corona Youth Music Project, the Orchestra of St. Luke's, um, to really speak to students about this um, and speak to their parents about, you know, kind of what what's going on in their communities and highlight those student voices. So it's really how um, the, the arts and TDU, I think, are unique in where we get to shine that spotlight. Um, you know, especially in within the context of these different issues. Um, so yeah, I think I think that that's that's the role of the arts, and especially uh, you know, I think a lot about education just because of my background. And um, my favorite thing to challenge some of my students with too is saying, you know, give me bring me a piece by a composer that you think that I haven't heard of before, um, and then we'll play that and we'll talk about their life and we'll talk about what that means for the music that they composed, and that's something that any music student can do. That's something that any orchestra member can bring to their conductor or to their artistic director. This is a story that I want to share with you. Um, so TDU does offer free repertoire consultations also um, to classical music, uh, individual classical musicians, chamber groups, orchestras, um, so that we can kind of get the word out that these stories are out there and they're waiting to be told. What amazing work. And I, I love that your experience as an educator in the arts too um, can really help inform the mission of this organization and what you're doing now in New York City. Um, and I think the fact that you talked about sort of how it's, it's, it's your prerogative as an orchestra and as an activist orchestra to choose what you spotlight. You're, you're taking power into your own hands to reframe what we think about music and where we, where we would position music in our lives um, and how um, it's such a powerful tool for conjuring images for, uh, like I mentioned earlier, wellness, relaxation, but also really boldening and, and empowering people. So um, I think we could all, I hope it would, if we all incorporated music a little bit more into our work, I wonder what that would do. I think asking that question more and more should be part of our agenda moving forward. Um, especially when we think about really the social fabric that we're all really trying to weave more tightly together and, yeah. and our roles in various ways uh, vary right now and in, in where we're positioning our effort and our time. But uh, music might be that thread that connects things together and art, and the arts more generally. Um, Amshala, I wanted to turn it over to you. You had something else to mention around women of color, people of color and democracy building, which I, I would love to 
get to spotlight. I also know we are over time and this has just been such a rich discussion and you all have so much information to share with us. So we are gonna continue to go on just a little bit longer. Of course, if others need to leave, thank you for joining us. Yeah, sorry, don't wanna go on too long, but I just, one thing I did wanna add was just that um, I think one of the reasons that organizations like TDU and other groups are so um, critical and inspiring is because I think in recent decades, you know, the, the sort of traditional democracy issues have been um, more visibly owned by like white led uh, social justice organizations and that has to change right because that historically was not the case. Um, and it shouldn't be and and the reality is, is that if you don't have a diverse group of people by class by race by gender um, advocating for solutions, then you're not going to have those holistic solutions right and so we have to find ways of engaging more people it shouldn't just be like Yale graduates from the ACLU right like it should be all of us who are engaged in the fight um, for our democracy and understand that it is a bread and butter issue in the same way that um, housing is or uh, education is um, and that it really is uh, so important for people of color and for women of color to be leading those fights. So again, we can have the kind of rich, holistic, honest discussions about what kinds of solutions we need. I'd, I'd love to close by hearing, closing remarks from each of you, but I'd also like to pose each of you the same question, which is, you know, joining us today are, we have a pretty varied audience. We have students, uh, graduate students, undergraduate students, some working in public health, some working in human rights, um, many external you know, activists and um, grassroots organizers. And there are some of those people may or maybe more or less engaged or informed. And so I'm wondering to sort of level that playing field a little bit. If each one of you could give one piece of advice to somebody who is wanting to grow their own political participation or know how to get involved in act activism and advocacy around these issues we've talked about today in a time like this where it can feel so daunting and overwhelming and negative um, and feel hard to enter that. What would you recommend? What's one thing that somebody could do right now? Um, and Amshul, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, so I would say two things. One, uh, start reading your local news. Like, uh, like I know that the federal stuff is on everybody's mind right now, and that's like the the thing that most papers report on. But like, if you live in New York City, start reading City and State. Like, it will give you so much information about what is actually happening in your own backyard, and like will help you start to think about, okay, this is actually an issue I wanna work on, right? Like I really care about rezoning and go on as I really care about, you know, affordable housing in New York City. So that's one thing I would say. And then the second thing I would say is like, once you figure out like what really is kind of your passion, find a community organization that works on it. And most likely like you'll see them quoted in articles or whatever, you can do just like a Google search, you know, um, uh, but find a local community grassroots organization, like that's where the power lives in this country. And they are the people who are really fighting these important fights um, and throw your lot in with them. Thanks, Amshula. Jennifer? Yeah, and Amshula raises a great point. I often joke that there is an organization for every single issue out there. There's some sort of organization that you can find on social media and get involved in. And usually the, or, these organizations are extremely welcoming and warm and want to have people who are passionate about those issues involved there. If voting is your passion, there is a fantastic coalition in New York State called uh, Let New York Vote that is comprised of good government groups, voting rights groups, uh, reproductive health care groups, groups who have any sort of skin in the game when it comes to 
furthering issues as well as unions and individuals as well. It's it's very grassroots heavy. So if you're interested in that, Let New York Vote is a fantastic coalition to get involved with. And they're very good at amplifying their grassroots to make sure that people who are really passionate have the opportunity to participate in a really, really direct way. And my last closing, closing thing I wanna tell people that I've been trying to do the last couple of weeks leading up to tomorrow and probably going forward even after that, is yes, tomorrow's election day. And if you already voted, that's fantastic. If you're still gonna vote, that's also fantastic. But don't be surprised if we don't have results for a really long time. Here in New York State, we don't even certify our results until December 6th. So it's tomorrow's election day, but this is a marathon, not a sprint. It's gonna be a, per a pretty long time before we actually know what the results are gonna be. We'll have like a vague idea of what the results will be probably really, really late tomorrow night into early tomorrow morning or the next day morning, but just be calm, you know, just relax, have a, have a hot tea and just know that everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I personally really do appreciate that advice and that information. So I'm sure others do as well. Um, Sarah, over to you. And I'm going to tack on an additional final question for you after your kind of final remarks. And, uh, oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think that for the arts in particular, um, you know, whether you use it for rest or whether you use it for activation, the arts are essential to change. Um, you know, and, and change is, uh, excuse me, give me one second, sorry. Um, when we think about, um, you know, how change happens, uh, it, it happens on an individual level and it happens uh, through storytelling. You don't know that an issue exists until you realize that a larger community or somebody has this issue in the first place. Um, so go ahead and use the arts to tell your story, use the arts for rest, use the arts to energize yourself, um, you know, especially in the coming months as, you know, there might be a lot of uncertainty and there might be a lot of change. Um, so I, I think that for everyone, um, my best advice is, is not to get discouraged, but, um, you know, to find a way to be creative um, and know that your voice matters and know that, you know, change doesn't happen without you. This, uh, you may have already answered this in uh, <laughs> your statement just now, but I wanted to ask you just um, for your advice on how how to galvanize people with the arts or, or even more specifically, what creative strategies have you utilized at TDU or that you think about um, that should be and can be used for greater community engagement? Any advice for any of us today? Yeah, I think that um, music in particular it has been used in movements of social change, I, I mean, since time immemorial. Uh, this is something to have music at a gathering, um, you know, or in times when we can't gather, to have music to share with one another in other ways is so um, vital to sending across a message. Music itself is its own language, right? Um, and so the things that we cannot say, we end up hearing or we end up performing or we end up playing. Um, so with the arts, especially like that example that, um, you know, I shared earlier, if you are able to get an instrument and go out to uh, a place to get people to better understand or, or pay more attention to a certain message, go ahead and do that. If you're able to support an art, um, you know, an art institution, do that as well. There, uh, when we think about the theater, going to the theater is not just sitting in a chair and watching a performance. It's the restaurant that you patronize afterward. It's the happy hour that, that you attend beforehand. It's the bullet, grocery store bulletin board where you find uh, you know, the theater performance in the first place. So engagement in the arts is really its own ecosystem. Um, so the more that you engage with that ecosystem, that you engage with that community um, and promote the arts, I, I think the closer that you get to uh, creating change in, in your community. I think that is a great note to end on. Um, it is uplifting to me, a little bit inspiring, which I think we could all use right now. Um, so with that, I would really love to thank uh, Sarah, Amshla, and Jennifer for being here today. Uh, and again, to TDU for, uh, for sharing the clip from that community reading. Um, thank you for the work that you all do and for your really insightful comments today that I think were so educational for so many of us. 
Um, and hopefully are gonna inspire a lot of us to go on and, and not just act tomorrow or and vote or <laughs> or if we already have voted, great. Um, please do vote if you haven't, but um, tools that we are gonna need in this next year. And so thanks to all of you for, for doing that work and for sharing it with us. Um, and with that, I'll just say uh, good luck everyone, stay safe and healthy, and thank you for joining us. I believe we're gonna drop a link in the chat just for anyone who's interested in checking out some of the other events in this series. Um, we've had a couple this fall and we'll have a few this spring. Um, and hope that you will join us. So you can see now the Human Rights Institute just dropped something in the chat uh, for a little bit more information and the link. Uh, and with that, I'll just say thank you very much again and take care everyone.